Chairman and CEO of Kaiser Permanente, Bernard Tyson. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's great to be here. Bernard, what motivated you to get into the healthcare business? You know, I've always known I wanted to be in healthcare from a child up, and I've told this story uh, many times before. In part, it was because my mother was sick when I was growing up. So we spent a lot of time uh, with doctors and in hospitals. And you know, I've always had this appreciation for the physician. It was this person in a white coat that did wonderful things to help my mom and therefore to help our family. Um, and then when she was hospitalized, she was um, suffering from diabetes. And uh, many times I would go to the hospital and there was always these kind people who were helping. So originally I wanted to be a doctor and then later I decided more on the business side so I went into a hospital administration. So it's a very personal meaning for you? Yes, it's, it's always been. You, you run a huge organization, <laughs> 180,000 yes. people, over 10 million members, 18,000 doctors or more. Uh, how do you create shared purpose, not just across this uh, geographically dispersed organization, but one that's changing so rapidly? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. You know, I would say first, everyone is grounded in the mission of the organization. Um, so it tends to uh, do a lot that people know why they're there. And I would say a lot of people, especially people who stay within Kaiser Permanente, there's, I've held this belief, there's something in them that is aligned with where we want to go as an organization. And our mission is a bigger than life mission. And it's a all hands on deck required mission to accomplish it. Because it's about making high quality healthcare accessible and affordable for everyone. So clearly the mission plays a, a, a big role. I would say the second thing is um, we tell stories. We have stories in our organization. We have the history of our organization is a story. And how the mission came about is a story. It's a story about Henry J. Kaiser. And it's about in today's you know, day and age, if he was still alive, he probably would be the equivalent of a multi-billionaire. Uh, but during that time, what he always remembered was his mom died before she should have. That was his thought. And the only reason she died is because she didn't have access to care, because they were poor. And so that's the birth of Kaiser Permanente. It was derived from this incredible individual who said that his legacy would be today the organization that I'm honored to chair. And how do you get that narrative, those values, to the last person in the organization? We tell stories. We talk about it. We use examples of it. Um, I talk about affordability all the time. Um, I go out and do site visits on location. I have social media, which I love, by the way. And so I get to talk directly to people. My executives talk, the doctors talk, it's a common theme. When we hear back from the public that we've nailed it in terms of the high quality accessibility and affordability, it's shared across the organization. It's something that we have everyone to um, work on with us and we make it a part of the collective agenda. And we talk about how you can help to achieve the mission as opposed to wanting people to feel like it's been done to them. You know, it strikes me though that you've made a shift, maybe even a seismic shift in what we think of healthcare was somebody gets sick, I'll help you get better. Somebody fell down and broke their leg, I'll fix their leg. Rich or poor, that was still the, the, the centric element of it. But it seems now it's about, you've made a shift of it, it's wellness, how people have a healthy life and how you maintain that healthy life, get sick less often, get injured less often, and recover faster. The shift is, what prompted that shift and were there, were there uh, allies and adversaries to that? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, well, the, the organization was always built around keeping you healthy. 
So prevention has always been the centerpiece of Kaiser Permanente. Um, what happened was, I would say about 12 years ago, uh, I took on an assignment with the organization, and that was to um, tell the story about who we are. Uh, and from that was born what we today call Thrive. When we started to tell the story about, you know, if you have a heart attack, we provide the best care, which is true. But I stepped back with the team and I said, but people don't wake up every day saying, I want to have a heart attack so I can see how Kaiser Permanente work. That's not really who we are. And um, at the end of the day, what we did was simply answer the question, who we are which is different from what we do. So if you have a heart attack, absolutely. We have great care and affordable care and accessibility to care. But who we are, we're an organization that really is trying hard to keep you healthy. So we don't want you to have the heart attack. And so unlike the industry, we invest heavily in prevention, early detection, um, early intervention, because working that upstream not only allows you to thrive, it also is more effective in how you take care of a person and is a greater benefit to the person as opposed to waiting until the person has a heart attack or a stroke or suffer a diabetic attack. For the industry, it forced the industry to begin to ask itself, what's our purpose in life? The healthcare industry grew up taking care of sick people. It was designed to intervene when a person got sick. And we said that makes no sense. The healthcare system should look holistically at really how do you maximize the healthy life years of a person. And that really is the underpinning of Kaiser Permanente, that our goal is for someone to live a healthy life for as long as they are alive and that they will continue to be productive throughout all stages um, of their lives. Let me uh, switch to an enormously important topic that you've written passionately about, you've spoken passionately about, and that's how we build a more inclusive and respectful society for all. And, and you've written about the experience of, despite your accomplishments of business, uh, being treated like um, every black man that has been um, persecuted. Uh, talk about that and how you feel that we as a, a society need to change. Yeah, you know, um, I guess I have been um, willing um, I recently called it in an article that I did in Fortune magazine, um, more of an obligation. Um, race relations is something that we've never really come to terms with in our country. Um, we've gotten along for a while, and then you know we have incidences that we all can trace in which you see the other side of what we tend to cover up. Uh, and in my world, it's the O.J. Simpson trial, and it's the Rodney King, and those moments where you can see, um, uh, you know, how people really feel on, on particular issues. And so given everything that was going on with the um, recent uh, shootings, which in many of the African-American communities is like, <laughs> we've known this, but what has happened today is the beautiful camera that can film anything at any time is now bringing to the rest of the world what we've been taught and what we've seen and what we have have experienced within our communities. And so um, I'm simply, uh, in, in some ways, using my voice to say, um, in hopefully a constructive way, that um, let me tell you how I'm treated in my C-suite. Uh, let me tell you how people treat me, how people uh, cater to me at times, how people honor me. And then let me tell you what it's like when I get out of my suit and tie and just happen to put on a pair of jeans 
and a, a, a sweat jacket and literally walk or, or ride down from the 27th floor of my suite to the streets. And then let me tell you the world that I live. And so I decided to do that and to tell that story um, as someone who probably one would say would have some level of credibility that, you know, we should hear what at least this person is describing to us. And I think that the first article that I did was intended uh, to, in some ways, represent a point of view at the time in which, and in particular with the Michael Brown situation, it was at the time in which the narrative started to shift away from, was it right to kill this young man and have him laying on the streets for four to five hours to look what he was doing before this happened. And, and, and I didn't want the narrative to shift all of a sudden to the um, stereotypical response that comes, quite frankly, in these incidences. Whether they're true or not, there's an, always an impression that you must have been doing something. Ironically, when I wrote the article, I got, I don't know, over 3,000 uh, comments. Some of the comments had that tone in there. It was, you must have been doing something when I described what happened between me and the police officer. And so my intention is simply to say, um, in my world, that there are people who don't have a, what I call a mental map of how to relate to me. It might be because they haven't interacted a lot with an African-American male. They haven't um, matured to see someone, African-American male, in a position like mine, and it's sort of like a mystery. How did that happen? And you only can get past all that with dialogue and discussion, and both sides opening up. This is, as I call it, this is how I roll. Right? This is who Bernard is, and this is who you are. And it's that kind of transparency of, of a relationship yeah. that I think moves us to the next um, level. And that's really what I'm after. That's what I'm after within Kaiser Permanente. At the end of the day, um, I want to create an environment where people want to come in and just be who they are and bring their best forward. And who has a right to decide who owns the room? And my point of view is uh, people earn their way into the room. And once you have earned your way into the room, you have rights. And nobody has more rights than you do. Everybody has rights and, and it's who you are. And that's what you are representing. And in Kaiser Permanente, we work very hard in respecting individuals and what they can bring uh, to the table and treating people with respect. And part of respect is an obligation to get to know the person, the culture, the nuances, in a way in which the person always feel that I'm respected. So that's, that's the background to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very that's profound. fantastic. Very, profound. Uh, very, very thoughtful. And to bring that into the culture today would be a blessing for everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.